Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, if you have a Bible, would you join me in reading from the Scriptures? And I'm going to be reading from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. So you can turn there or scroll there. Let's read together. Uh, Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to be, because of time and uh, the nature of the message, I'm going to be just selecting various samples of Acts chapter 2. So let's read uh, firstly from verse 1 to 6 of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of flames of fire appeared to them and rested on each of the disciples. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Let's go down to verse 14 to 18. But Peter the apostle, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose since it is only the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days, says Joel, God, as God declares, I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse 22 to 24. Men of Israel, Peter went on to preach, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him from the dead and loosed the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up and of the, this we are witnesses. Being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you see and hear. Verse 36, so let all the house of Israel know that God has made him Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. In verse 41 to 45 at the end. And so those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 people. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Awe came upon every person, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. They were all who believed, they all who believed were together, and they held all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any one had need. It's an amazing portion of Scripture that this whole of the, 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 the Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to be preaching about that this morning. Some of you we might have met in 2017. Uh, Dr. Crutchley took some of you uh, to South Africa, uh, my native and home country, uh, where my wife and I live. And I met some of you there in 2017, and uh, through that connection, uh, I'm on sabbatical. I teach at a Baptist seminary in Cape Town, South Africa, and I'm on a sabbatical, and it so worked out that uh, uh, through that connection, I'm here for this semester teaching in the Department of Religion. It's really good to know that some of you have, got a, have had, and some of you will have, I hear that some of you might be going to Cape Town uh, in a few months' time. 
uh, that you are, have, uh, some of you have had or are having, will have a direct experience with South Africa, not just hearsay, we hear on the news or hear in the history of our, our, our country, but having a real first-hand experience. South Africa is a great, it's a diverse country. Uh, if there's one verse, uh, one word that would characterize South Africa, it's diversity. It's the only country in the world, I think, that has 11 national languages. It's the only country in the world that has five languages in its national anthem. So you might think you, your national anthem, you've got to remember it and try coming to South Africa, practice the national anthem with five languages. Uh, I'm sort of just getting it right now. It's a, it's a country which is, holds a lot of promise. It's, it's a promising country with all this diversity through all that happened in the last decade or so of people trying to come together, the promise of a united nation, a united country. But it's also at the same time a very problematic country because everybody has different ideas of what the country should be like and what the future should look like. And trying to get cohesion amidst of all the diversity is very, very problematic. But I'm not here this morning, I'm going to tell you more about South Africa. I want to tell you, and I want to look at this verse in light of something which is far more important than our country or our national uh, uh, homeland. I want to tell you about the church of Christ, the church of God, which this chapter speaks about. Because the most promising social body or entity or community or people is no uh, ethnic nation or certain nationality, the most promising group of people on this world are, are the people who are part of the church of the living God. The church is an incredibly promising uh, uh, group of people. It's the city of the living God, the Bible calls us. And the book of Revelation ends off with a picture of the church being the city. But also, the church is also a very problematic social entity, isn't it? because of all its fractures and all its divisions and its tragic history. I teach church history. People have often said, well, the more you know about church history, the, the less you want to be part of the church. It is a problematic institution as well. As I've been here for a few uh, weeks, just over a month, I've traveled around a little bit locally here, and I've seen, I've seen the same things. I've seen many steeples. But under each of those steeples is a different name. And sometimes I think maybe the names are sort of scoring points against the next church. But once again, great promises. So many steeples, so much, so much promise of the church in the country, but also so, it's so many problems, just like in our country. But God has not changed on his plans for this world. His government or his kingdom has made inroads into this world through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is the place and the program that God is using to bring about world redemption and world change. And no matter uh, how many times uh, people might have political plans for their country and how much we want a united South Africa or a united America or, you, uh, or a united nations. The more we try to be united, the more divided we are. But the church is God's institution of choice to bring about redemption and change to this world. And we dare not give up on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though it's got all these problems. Have you ever asked yourself a question in the light of all the steeples and all the names and all the churches, and uh, there are more than I can dream or imagine here in your country, I'm sure, is the question, well, well what makes that steeple or that church really the church? Uh, what makes the church a church? Um, how do we know what are as my message is, the marks of the Christian church. What are the defining marks that make a church a church? Is it the great music? Wow, that church is a real good vibe and the music is phenomenal. No, it's not the music. 
Is it the size that makes a church a church? No, it's not the size. Is it nice and friendly people and you feel warm and you, you, you like the place because the people are friendly? Does that make a church the church? No. Is it the activities or the fun that it offers in the church for you? It's not that either. Is it the education? If you have educated, if you have people who have got doctorates and they're well trained in theology, does that make the church? Is that the mark of the church? Is it in her name or is it in denomination? Is it in history, traditions? This is an important question. And as most of you are young and uh, I'm trusting believers in Christ, you, you need to be spending your part of your life serving the church and you need to know, well, what makes the church the church? Well, the answer is in Acts chapter 2. So let's think a little bit about Acts chapter 2. This is, a, this is the big bang of the church. When the church was born, it was a big bang, and we're still living in the reverb of the big bang that happened on that day at 9 o'clock in the morning, 50 days after Jesus was crucified. It was the birthday of the Christian church, Acts chapter 2. This is the mother church, and all other churches are to be her daughters and are to be participating in what happened here on this particular day of Pentecost, 50 days. That's where Pentecost comes from after the day when Jesus was crucified. On this day, Jesus prophesied, and it happened, he baptized his disciples in the Holy Spirit, and they received the Holy Spirit, and they were never the same. They had been transformed. Something Jesus did changed these disciples and their lives and all who joined them. I like to see this as the day that Jesus was engaged to his church, to these people, the day that Christ betrothed himself or affianced himself to this group of people. The Bible says one day when Jesus returns, it's, it's the wedding day. We're not there yet. But, but there's an, the engagement has already taken place. The wedding day is still to come, and Christians and the church are caught between the engagement day and the wedding day. When I was uh, engaged, we had how many days? My wife's here. She, a few, we had a few weeks. We had a few weeks between engagement and marriage, just the way circumstantially it happened. People thought that Jesus would come back soon, that the engagement period would be short, but it's still a long time. On this day of engagement, picture with me, and I'm using this uh, imaginatively, picture with me the ring that Jesus gives to the church. I like to see this chapter as the ring that Jesus gave to this church, and this ring has three diamonds on it, and these three diamonds are the three marks of the church, of what makes the church the church, and are found in this particular chapter. And you know the bride by the ring that she wears. That is the distinguishing mark of what makes the church the church. So let's have a look at these three rings in the next 15 minutes. I'm trying to convert the clock. The, the first dime, the first mark of the church, the first diamond is a new word or a new message that came into the world, a new word. It's amazing on the day of Pentecost here how, P, how Peter is at pains to get people's attention, not just on the experience and uh, that these Galileans all found themselves miraculously speaking known languages that they'd never learnt. That was a miracle in itself. But Peter is at pains to get these people's ears, like I'm trying to get yours, and get these people's minds focused upon a message, upon a new word that uh, a new message that came into the world. And on the day of Pentecost, it's marked by preaching, by proclamation. Not just by a time of prayer or just receiving the Spirit or something in concert. Peter wanted to bring the focus 
on the message. He did a little bit of apologetics of defense. These people are not drunk. It's too early in the morning. He did a little bit of apologetics. He gave a bit of a scripture, and then he preached the message. And this message was a unique message that had never been heard before. This message that he preached is the heart of what makes the church the church. The church is a people that is defined by its message. The message makes the church the church. Our message is its primary and first mark. And if we get the message wrong, the word wrong, if a church or generally the churches get the message wrong, they get their, themselves wrong. The quality of the preaching, the quality of what a church preaches is the mark of a falling or a standing church. Just consider how much talking there was on the day of Pentecost. It's though the church was born into the world talking, like all babies do, but making a lot more sense on this day. Speaking. Peter got up and he, he preached from Scripture. He did explanation. All being filled with the Holy Spirit on this particular day. The content of this message was startlingly new. The content of his message focused upon the sin of the people in crucifying their Messiah, the biggest shock any people group have ever heard. The sin of these people in crucifying their Messiah and the reverse response of God from, by raising him from the dead. The crucifixion of the Messiah, which Peter said, you have done, and God's contrasting response of raising him from the dead. This was a startling message. The message of Christ, who he is, his death and his implications and his resurrection and his implications are the heart of what makes the Christian church the church and is our message. And this applies to each one of us. We all know, well, we weren't there and we didn't put Jesus on the cross physically, but he was on the cross because of you. He was on the cross because of me. My sins were what he was bearing on the cross. And Peter communicated the startling message. They've crucified the Messiah. It's exactly like what the 11 sons of Jacob must have felt like when they heard that they have put the prince of Egypt as their brother. And there they bowed before the most powerful man in the world and they realized that they're the ones who did, who put him, who sold him into Egypt as a slave. And the shock of that day of those sons of Jacob bowing at the feet of Joseph, who they thought was somebody else, when they realized that this was the one they had crucified. But... But the message of the gospel is of our sin and of Jesus' work on the cross, but it's also of God's great grace to the world, that even though this has taken place, God is not destroying the world or destroying these people, but he is saving them. Joseph did not put his brothers in prison for good. God did not come and they've crucified his son and well, what will he do now? He'll judge and get rid of all these people who've crucified his son. Do you know what God did? And it says here, after they had rejected God's son, God gave them the spirit. Isn't that mercy? It's, it's incredible mercy what's taking place here. And the community, the church is the community that bears this message of sin and of grace and of mercy. It says here, all those who received the word, those who received the word, those who listened to Scripture were about 3,000. They responded to the word. This is the Christian church, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The first jewel in the ring is the word. The second diamond by which Christ engaged his church with is he gave them a new spirit. He gave them the Holy Spirit on this particular day the Spirit. Fifty days in Jewish custom of the day was a celebration of the giving of the law at Sinai. 
This, it was on this day when they commemorated the giving of the law that the Holy Spirit, the giving not of the Mosaic law again, but of the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Someone moved into the midst of these people and he took up his home at nine o'clock in the morning. And this was the Spirit of the living God. This was the presence of God symbolized by the fire. Came unambiguously with audio and visual media on that day. It was the, it was the loudest church meeting you've ever been to. Nothing like this has ever happened again. It was dramatic when, he, when the indwelling began. I've always thought it sounded a bit like a horror film, the indwelling. You know, didn't somebody say truth is stranger than fiction? The church being the inhabitation of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit is changed everything. It connected these people to the Savior. It was like the umbilical cord. It connected them. Jesus was in glorified in heaven. Something happened that connected them to Jesus, connected them to each other. That was the presence of the Holy Spirit. He announced His arrival, and they were filled with joy. They were filled with fear. They were filled with prayer. God was on sight that day doing the work, and that's the, the mark of the church, the presence of God, God in our midst. And sadly, church history is filled with stories, we read church history, of the Spirit being institutionalized, the Spirit being domesticated, or the Spirit being marginalized. But the Spirit has come. The third diamond in the engagement ring which Jesus gave to the church on this day, is there was a new love. There was a new love. This was the mark of this church. Luke gives his account at the beginning and towards the end of the unity of the people that had gathered together. Did you know this is the account? It's the only time in history when the church has all been together in one place. The next time that'll happen is at the return of Christ when we will forever be with the Lord. They were all together. And through the message and through the Spirit that had come into their midst, they were forged and welded into a common soul, a common life, koinonia, a very rich word, a shared life. And it says at the end that, that people felt that what happened to their brother or sister was happening to them. Their needs were my needs, and they, they, they helped one another. They sold things. They cared for one another. They felt they were a common soul. Verses 17 to 18 is very clear that in this new community, it's all flesh. The Spirit is given to all flesh, sons and daughters and young men and old men, servants and masters, all the distinctions that, that become problematic and fracture people. Something is welding together. The diversity is coming together. There is a reversal of the Tower of Babel on this particular occasion. Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are the church, that you are my disciples. Many disciples in those days, but you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Those are the three diamonds that came. Church history records us the imbalance of those three things. And you might be attending one church that likes one of the things and doesn't like the other thing. Church history is filled, and churches, I'm sure, are filled with either those who focus more upon preaching, those who focus more upon the Spirit, and those who just focus more upon loving. It's a tripod, and any imbalance causes, an Im any one that falls short causes an imbalance. We need all three of them. They are what the church is about. They are the presence of God, His governance in the world, take, bringing about redemption in this world. So my appeal to you this morning is to put on the ring yourself. Put on what Christ gave 
to the church here. Put it on. Own it. Make it your own. That, that message, that presence, that love, own it. Put it on. Put on the ring yourself. Make it your own. Not just something for some other group of people, but this is what you need to become a part of. Become and be part of the bride, part of the people of Christ, part of the church. And not only just to put it on, but to live your life on that basis and to seek to be part of the politics of God. That's what the church is, Christianity is, is the politics of God in this world, the governance of God, what's happening in this truth, in this love, and in the Spirit. To, to seek that in your life, to seek that in your Christian community. And don't fall short in any one of those things. Maybe one of those things, you've, you're falling short quite seriously in your life. Is it the Word? How is that doing in your life? You're thinking about Scripture. You're getting into the message. Is it the Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit marginalized in your life? Or is he maybe domesticated, that he is just a part of our system? Or is he the living fire as he was on this day? And what about the love, Christ's love? And we know that is at the heart of it, really, the love. How is your love quality? Not just being nice and friendly and hello, and, but the love of Christ, the sacrificial love of Christ that we see here. Christ will return. The church is engaged to him. How will he find you if he returns sooner than you expected? Let's be prepared and let's live in and be, live in this word and the spirit and the love. If we do, we will be prepared for him at any time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what a glorious day Acts chapter 2 testified to the big bang of the church as it was born with shouts of joy, not of pain. We thank you for the glorious day and we thank you for your betrothal to the church in the word and in your very presence in our midst and in your love. Help us to get it right in a community and in a country and in a world that is so fractured with all of our divisions. Help us to get it right. And I pray for each of these students. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to speak. May this word and the message of this ring and these three things be in them. May they remember them. And may they participate in the glorious community called the Church of the Living God. Amen.